time constraints, we'll skip with a number of formalities and uh, just get to what we're going to do, which is to uh, listen to Professor John Esposito. Uh, he has just come from a presentation at Pearl Continental, and uh, he has to leave for another presentation right after he gets done here. So that's one of the reasons we are rushing a bit. Uh, he doesn't need any introduction, but I, I, I guess this is the way things are done in universities. And uh, you know, we can't really. We can look like we're going, we, look, we are going against um, the formalities of the universities, but we have to stay. You know, we have to pay them at least some respect. So a brief introduction uh, to uh, Dr. Esposito. He's an, uh, uh, an American professor of international affairs and Islamic studies at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. He is also the director of the Prince Al-Walid Center for Muslim Christian Understandings at Georgetown. <coughs> he has written over 45 books, which include The Future of Islam, Islamophobia, and the Challenge of Pluralism in the 21st Century, and Geography of Religion, Where God Lives. This is his uh, official title of introduction. Uh, the one thing that is not mentioned uh, in this introduction is, and I would like to share with you, is that Professor Esposito um, got a PhD in Islamic studies in the early 1970s at a time where religious studies as a subject of, uh, as an academic subject of inquiry was virtually unknown. Uh, if it was known, it was frowned down upon and Islamic studies as an academic discipline was virtually unknown. Uh, he got his PhD uh, during the, the year in which he got his PhD, I think he was the only one in, in all of North America uh, to get a PhD in, in Islamic studies. So during his student days, um, <clears throat> he is kind of thinking outside of the box, looking uh, at the future, and uh, not letting the dominant paradigm uh, decide what you should or should not study. Uh, I guess if you had let the dominant paradigm decide uh, at that time what to study, uh, you would have been a, a political scientist uh, doing modernization theory or something. And uh, we know how well that has all panned out uh, over the 10 to 15 years. So uh, with those words, uh, Professor Esposito, we are absolutely delighted that you took the time uh, from your busy schedule to come uh, and join us. And the floor is yours for the next uh, 40 minutes or so. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Just. Uh, by way of following up on a comment that was made, I was the first person to get a PhD in Islamic studies, uh, in fact, in the, uh, in, in, in the university uh, at, uh, at that time in the 70s. It was also when I came to Pakistan. My first visit to Pakistan was in 1973, which will give you an idea of roughly how old I am. And I've been married 52 years, so that will give you even more of a sense of it. But the advantage of being married 52 years is my nephew had a wedding, and I don't dance very much. But they had a, a, a dance very slow, which I like. My wife likes to dance. And it was for married couples. So the floor was full. And then the fellow said, anybody marry five years or less, please leave the floor. And he moved to 10 years. 15, 20, when he got to 30, I said to my wife, relax, we have plenty of time here. <laughs> when he got to 35, I said, we're going to win. He got to 40, he got to 45, and then finally he came down off the stage and said, how long have you been married? So I told my other nephew, okay, you can get married and we'll do the same dance again. It felt like I won something. I like I to compete and win. Uh, I first want to talk a bit about Muntaz uh, who's a good friend and, uh, and a colleague. Muntaz was an amazing person. Uh, he was a real tra a tra a trailblazer in terms of uh, Middle East studies, uh, Islamic studies, and certainly the study of uh, Pakistan and South Asia. 
educated here, he then went to the University of Chicago and studied with Fazur Rahman, one of the great uh, Muslim scholars of the 20th century, and a man named Lenin Binder, a very famous political scientist. Combining all of that, he worked at the Brookings Institute, which is a major research institute for many years, doing consulting, publishing, and then taught at Hampton University for a good stretch of time. But I think the character of Mutaz can be seen in a, in a, number, of, uh, in a number of ways. Uh, one, he was extraordinarily bright, reform-minded, uh, but always polite and could always say things in a way that didn't totally offend people. He was very unassuming. So basically, a man who did not come across as having an ego. He was the exact opposite of myself. When we built my, our center, I had my fedora. If you walk through to get into my office, we had to make it wider so I could get my head through. But with Mumtaz, given everything that he knew, if you were to meet him until he was called on, he wasn't competing with people. He was very, with his, with his students, he taught them, he encouraged them, but he did it with, with the colleagues. I mean, I would see, when I would see Mumtaz, he'd always, he'd always say something very positive you know, to me. That just made, you know, it was just really funny. He just sort of, you know, he would thank you for doing X or Y, you know, kind of congratulating you. Uh, rather than, as many of us are, you know, we meet somebody, we'd like to talk to them, and then the first thing you say is, oh, so what are you doing? You, know, you finished the book, well, what else are you doing? And then we tell them what, what we do. Mutaz was an advisor to a project that we had, a major project with the Pew Foundation on Muslims in the American Public Square run by Zahid Bukhari, Suleiman Iyad, and Mumtaz. So I would see him regularly you know, when, when he came to Georgetown. And in many ways, his, his being a pioneer could be seen in the fact that, for example, he founded a group called the American Council for the Study of Islamic Societies, because we wanted to look at Muslim societies across the world. He was one of the founders, one of his most active people. He got involved in publishing a, a journal on political Islam. He was the kind of person that um, you would want to have as a friend, you would want to have as a colleague. He's the kind of person that, if I continued to talk about him, you would realize that I was an emotional, an emotional attack. Uh, okay, let's move on to talking about me. Okay, now we'll get out of that. Um, what I want to talk about today and very briefly, from what I understand, how much time do I have? I just want to be sure of this. 35 minutes. Oh, okay. I, I was told it's 15 minutes. Why can it be 35? No, 10 minutes. Okay. What? 10 minutes. Can you, it's like watching a clock on TV. You got 15 minutes, you got 35 minutes, you got 10 minutes. Okay. All right. I better get talking about the day before. Okay. I, I just want to talk to you a little bit about what I see where we are in Muslim West relations. I think we're at a very difficult time. I mean, I think everybody knows that. Um, I mentioned to somebody that I, I uh, did a round table at the uh, House of Lords in London uh, a short time ago, and we talked about Muslim West relations, and at one point, at, at the end of it, I said, I don't see any light at the end of the tunnel. Usually when you speak, this always, no matter how negative, you say, well, there's light at the end of the tunnel, you know. If this happens, if that happens. There isn't. There will be light at the end of the tunnel, and that's the challenge. If we create it. And that's really going to be the challenge. Now, I should tell you that when I first got my degree, nobody was interested in hearing about Islam, about Muslim-West relations. You didn't get invited to speak, any of that kind of thing. After 9-11, your audience has changed, because I can say to an audience, you may not want to be involved if you're young. You've got other things on your mind, but guess what? If the world really gets screwed up, it's going to affect the economy of your country. It's going to affect jobs. Or it's going to mean that there will be an invasion of your country. Or that there will be the likelihood. Or that people will be talking about the dangers of nuclear war. And, and, and suddenly, it was really 9-11 that drove home even more than Iran to people globally 
that one had to be concerned. Now, their interpretations would vary in terms of who was at fault, what needed to be done. But what I'm trying to say is that this question of this and West relations is not just an intellectual question. It's something that cuts across everyone's life, every, every, potentially, and every family's life. In terms of where we are in, in a Western context, is A, if we're talking about the Muslim world and Islam, fear of Islam has been normalized. It's normalized. Okay? By normalized, it means that it's accepted in Europe and America. And indeed, the fear card, card is played on consistently. Played on by whom? A, ISIS. Why do you think they did the beheadings? Because it's exactly what they wanted to do, to strike fear. The thing about terrorists is that in conventional warfare, it's easy. You wind up saying, I have a large army, you have 10,000 people, I'm not worried about you. But today we have what's called asymmetric warfare, which means that even five people or two people can make life miserable for anybody. So that sense of fear of Islam gets exacerbated by the, the attacks that take place, attacks that occur in the region, in this part of the world, but very much in recent years, attacks in Paris, in Belgium, attacks in the United States, etc., and politicians who play it. So you have ISIS that uses that fear and then does its critique of Western countries. Okay. And you, you've got Western politicians who use that fear. In America, with George W. Bush, even with Obama, etc., the emphasis is on security. When candidates go to work for office, what do they emphasize? Security. But what we see also in America and in Europe, but I'll talk principally about America, we also see a tendency in, in, in the last 10 years for Islamophobia to grow exponentially at the time of presidential elections or an invasion of the country. And if you go back and take a look at 2008 and 2012, the election of Obama, the fact that they made comments about whether or not he was a Muslim, the fact that he had to be very careful. Remember, after he became president, he, was, he, was, he went and visited a mosque in Cairo, in Turkey, but waited until his eighth year to go to a mosque in America. And, and the candidates began to, in those debates, people like Luke Gingrich and other candidates, to talk about Islam and the Muslim world, to talk about the fear of Sharia. In America, you have a Sharia frenzy in, in recent years. No Muslim or Muslim organizations asked for the introduction formally of Sharia in American law. And yet, more than 20 states have tried to pass legislation banning Sharia law. And in fact, you can't have Sharia law in the U.S. or in Western countries because the law of that country predominates. So it's impossible to do it, and yet this sense of fear and the, 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 the strength of those who play this card make people feel that way. And I want to emphasize there are two sides of the coin here, okay? It's not only America and American foreign policy at times with regard to invasion and occupation of countries or what we've seen recently uh, with going into countries and, and the killing of significant numbers of civilians as casualties, uh, who, are casualty, who are casualties. It's also the fact that indeed there are a lot of, of terrorist organizations that not only engage in terrorism, but that ISIS has excel at its ability to manipulate the internet and to therefore be a presence that is much larger than their actual numbers are. So part of our challenge in the future is how do we move beyond this? In Europe and America it's going to be very tricky. I, I did an interview for um, a Danish newspaper in which we talked about when would Danes possibly as a new poll ever uh, Danish Muslims be accepted really as Danes. And we talked about 10 to 20 years. He said he thought it would be 30 years, given the way things are going in Europe. The same thing I was in Oslo, you know, in Norway. Uh, it's not that Muslims are uh, treated very poorly 
by society. But that, in fact, Islam and Muslims are not seen as the uh, uh, possible being uh, good Danish citizens. The same thing is true, obviously, in Europe in terms of those who see Islam and Muslims as, for example, a number of people in uh, the current administration who will say that Islam is not a religion, which is interesting, right? Can you imagine how it would have if somebody got up and said Christianity is not a religion? I and mean, not for religious reasons, people would say intellectually that's pretty stupid and naive. You know, and, and who are you to say it's not a religion? You know, it's the people who practice or even if they don't practice, you don't see it as, as a religion. But by saying that, what they're really saying is Islam is not a religion, it's a political ideology. And once you say it's a political ideology, then you can say it's the enemy and it needs to be contained and or attacked. And indeed, we have uh, every, every, people from the Secretary of Defense to the Secretary of State to the Director of the CIA, who however different and talented they are, buy into that worldview and have articulated it. Uh, and, and unfortunately, the man who was elected president, you know, has played into that. You know, when on CNN, he says, Islam hates us. First of all, Islam can't hate us. It's not an actor. You know, it's like somebody saying Christianity hates us, you know, okay? But when you say that, it shows a real depth, because then you're talking about the religion itself. You see, if you were talking about individuals, then you can say, yeah, I didn't say everybody. I didn't rush through the whole community. You know, I said extremists, they will hate us. Part of the challenge that I think we have as we move forward is what role do we play in terms of the regions that we, we live in, as well as in a European and American context. In Europe and America, the reason it's important is it can endanger the civil liberties of Muslims, and we've seen that already. Okay? Endangering the civil liberties of, of, of Muslims. Um, and it also has affected American foreign policy. Because often when we frame something, we don't just say this country or this person. We use the word Muslim in front of it, which then can imply a far broader kind of threat once you use that. If you say it's a Muslim phenomenon, especially if you say the idea of radical Islamic terrorism, it's fine to say, from my point of view, radical Muslims. Okay? But if you say radical Islamic, then you're using the word Islam, then it gives the impression that Islam is the primary cause of that radicalization. The challenge will be, as we move forward, how do we get to a point where we begin to put the pieces together? If we look at Europe and America now, it's not just the growth of xenophobia, uh, anti-immigrant, so lots of immigrants, you know, in different countries. It's not just anti-immigrant in Europe and America, it's not just with regard to Muslims, it can be other immigrant groups. But it's also that, that, that tendency in, in which we are increasingly defining ourselves in terms of us and them. When you have an other, it's very easy if it's an other to presume that that other is completely different than you are. You know, completely different. When I was a young man studying uh, for my PhD, I'd have a number of my Muslim friends say, um, you know, I said, what kind of experience do you have? Because in our program, we brought people from different Muslim countries. The man that ran the program, Ismail Farouk, he got scholarships for them, so they came from different Muslim countries. And some of them would be really offended because they would say, you know, I'm talking to the average American, and it's as if they think I live in a jungle. You know, it's as if they, they, they don't recognize that I have an education. Well, that's changed a lot now because of globalization and communications. But back then, when you didn't have globalization and communications, for many people, it was the first time they met or saw somebody who said they came from a country called Pakistan. I remember even when I was a young academic, a colleague of mine said, so how was your summer? I said, it was good. He said, uh, how are things in Lebanon? I said, I was in Pakistan. He said, Lebanon and Pakistan, they're all the same. <laughs> and he was a German academic who saw himself as a real intellectual. Probably a real intellectual compared to the American academics. Probably felt, boy, we were really lucky to have him, that he was somehow cosmopolitan. Well, in, in our shrinking world, these kinds of, of, of issues about pluralism in our societies, if, you don't, if we don't realize that in the 21st century, religious pluralism and ethnic pluralism is important, 
Then we're going to have the problems that you see in Pakistan, in many parts of the world, and certainly in Europe and America today. You know, without that pluralism, you then have, rather than an inclusive idea, in which therefore all people can be citizens, regardless of ethnic or religious background, you get into an exclusivist approach. The problem with an exclusivist approach is that world has changed. You see, for many Europeans, you can see their problem if you get into their shoes. For generations, fathers, grandparents, all the way back, to be Danish was to be a white Dane speaking the Danish language, coming from Danish culture, marrying within. And so suddenly what a significant percentage of your population is now a, has a different color, let alone a different religion, making that adaptation and realizing that diversity is not a threat. It actually can enhance a society. But it's easy to try to make it into a threat. But until we accept the notion of religious and political pluralism, we have nowhere to go. A good example is Egypt. You have a coup against the first democratically elected president. Rather than saying, we don't like Morsi and what he did, so in the next elections we're going to do something about it. And the US and the EU say, oh, we don't, you know, we're concerned about that. We don't support it. And within several months, they ultimately recognize. In fact, President uh, Obama refused to call it a coup, or he avoided calling it a coup. So when you look at that Egyptian situation, you look within Egypt, if anything, when you see the reaction to Morsi and then the, the coup, you really see a breakdown of any sense of pluralism. You know, where you have the head of the Coptic Church, you know, siding with the coup. Uh, you have the military. A president Morsi was never a real president. He had the title, but he had no control over the judiciary, the military, the police, the security, I mean, you name it. Once a country loses that sense of national pride that has a diversity, it's going to be in trouble. Let alone today, as more and more countries are forced in a global world to be diverse. So European countries, whether they like it or not, are now much more diverse. America was founded by diverse people, but the problem is, for many, the new diverse group is then seen as a problem. After 9-11, there was a picture in the newspapers of a gas station, petrol station, and it had something like, kill them all, send them back, you know, where they go. For you said, kill them all and let Allah decide, or send them back to where they came from. And you could see the name of the guy who was an Italian-American, and I thought, my God, he's probably second generation, right? And he acts like he came over on the Mayflower in the 16th century to America, you know? He comes in, his family doesn't speak English, he learns English, he gets a job, the new group coming in, it's like, what do you mean, they don't speak English, they're foreign, they have different characteristics than people. This may sound very basic, but it's very interesting because it gets at the heart of where we are. And, and I'll end with it, just two examples. When I went to Georgetown, I was the first person, I almost said president, you can see my ambitions, I just want the plane, I don't want the job, just the plane. Um, but I was the first person to take the title Professor of Religion and International Affairs. And yet Georgetown has the oldest school of religion, international affairs in the world. Okay. The first person to get into that area. And to talk about politics and culture, that was something that you know, the social scientists would look down on. Now politics and culture is the biggest area. And in fact, social scientists, all, many of them want to publish in that area. It's like when I did Islam. When I did Islam, no book contracts, nothing, for years. I sent out proposals. They wouldn't answer. They'd say, nice idea, no more. Iran came, and I owe Ayatollah Khomeini my career and my first Lexus. First Lexus. Bin Laden got me my Lexus crew. Terrific car. Old time goes down, etc. The, the, the reality of it is that we now are functioning in this different world. And you as young people are in it. And some of you won't care, and that's okay. You'll be the losers. Some of you will just fall behind and be the losers. Politically, culturally, economically, I would predict that. Uh, the reality of it is that whether we like it or not, 
in a global world with global communications and also global weapons, it is important where Pakistan is if you're in America. And it is important where America is, where North Korea is, especially in our age. In an age of terrorism with asymmetric warfare, and in an age where we have so many nuclear you know, powers, we, we need to be conscious, those of us that want to be, of being global citizens that develop that kind of worldview and keep that in mind. Why? Because most of you will get into professions that you might say have nothing to do with it. But guess what? You vote. You know, and in the old days in America, a lot of people could just say, well, I'm not going to vote, it doesn't matter, you know, and I, and I trust the people to get into Congress. Now we don't like our Congress and people still don't vote. Now we have a situation where, although Hillary Clinton had three million more votes, still she could lose in our system. Part of the reason was that black people, some of them, Muslims, some of them, just decided not to vote. Millennials thinking, oh, well, Hillary Clinton will win or I'm, I don't care too much about what happens, and suddenly the impossible happened. You wind up with Mr. Trump um, as the President of the United States. And everybody you know, was stunned by that. But look at what's happening in France. Le Pen is a viable candidate. Gerd Wilders uh, in, in Holland did not make number one, but if you come in strong, he's, he, his party is a strong power. And Wilders is somebody who says, the Quran is mein Kampf, we should send all Muslims back where they came from, etc. So, I mean, that's there. And if you look at the way some people feel about America in the name of security, you know, uh, whether you're Mexican, whether you're Muslim, there's a tremendous concern about this kind of thing happening. The other thing I should mention at the end of it is that this would be culturally offensive, I'm sure. Um, those of you who have been texting, you know, while I'm speaking, I do that with other people you will find out that the net result is that you will be punished in the next life. <laughs> and you will be punished really bad. As President Trump would say, really, really bad. <laughs> thank you, uh, thank you very much, Professor Esposito. Uh, such a short time to touch on a uh, number of very important topics or issues. Um, I'd just like to comment on, or, or summarize, or repeat two of them. Uh, Professor Esposito began his presentation by mentioning the name of Ahmed uh, That name probably doesn't mean anything to most of the people in this, uh, in this auditorium. But that name is uh, among, again, one of the pioneers uh, in the early 70s, mid 70s, when Islamic studies was just being taken off, uh, uh, Dr. Ahmad, Mutaz Ahmad, was one of the one of the early uh, experts in this area. Uh, the other name that you mentioned brought back a lot of memories, uh, Dr. Ismail Rajiv Faruqi. The other name that used to be mentioned here is uh, Sayyid Hussein Nasser. Uh, these are the the grandfathers of, of uh, Islamic studies in the, in the United States. So for the younger generation, what you saw here uh, in, in Dr. Esposito is not just a, a scholar uh, of eminent standing right now, but uh, among the founding fathers of, of whom the other two are uh, Dr. Nasser and Dr. Uh, Ismail Farouki, and then Dr. Montaz Ahmed, and there's, a, there's an entire line and that line uh, has made its way into lumps. Uh, Dr. Ejaz Akram uh, is a part of that line and have, um, uh, he's not a doctor yet, but soon he will be a doctor. Hopefully, Junaid Ahmed, uh, who is uh, who work, uh, working towards his PhD in the University of Malaya. So uh, for the audience, for our students here, right, so you don't just have a, an eminent scholar, you have a piece of history. Uh, that was just here in front of you. That was one thing I wanted to draw your attention to. The second one is uh, the first first point that Dr. Esposito raised uh, at the beginning of his presentation, how um, ISIS on one side and certain politicians on the other side, how they are using or banking on fear. So we have two parties who apparently 
uh, are totally against each other, not just apparently, actually are against each other. They do want to destroy each other and get rid of each other. But we see how both parties are using the exact same logic, how their habits of thinking are exactly the same. There is no difference between the two other than a very superficial surface difference. And uh, when we look at that, it is not just uh, politicians in the West who will use the fear of Islam to promote their political agenda. We have, uh, we have politicians in the Muslim world who will use the fear of Islam to promote their political agenda. So this is not just uh, an American thing, or this is not just a European thing, where religion, the fear of religion, hyping up and artificially, uh, uh, artificially hyping up what religion and religious people can do, may do. Uh, this is not just uh, Geert Wilders or Donald Trump or Marie Le Pen. We have their equivalents right here uh, in Pakistan in both the political field and in academia. We cannot separate politics from academics. If there are people in the political field who are artificially hyping up the fear of religion to promote their political agenda, we have scholars in academia who artificially hype the fear of religion to promote their uh, academic uh, careers because that's a hot thing to do, that's an easy way to get onto the escalator. Uh, but then we are thankful that we have scholars like uh, uh, Professor Esposito who would, uh, who would want to, yeah, I'm sure Professor Esposito also wants to be the, on that escalator, but he wants to be on that escalator in a manner which is honest and which holds on to the standards of intellectual integrity. So these were two points and uh, I cannot, I know that we are short on time, but it is for me, uh, it's important that we have Dr. Uh, Ijaz Akram, uh, who has been, who was at Lums for 11 years. Uh, just recently, uh, he left to join the faculty at uh, National Defense University. Uh, because Professor Esposito was on uh, Dr. Ijaz Akram's uh, dissertation committee, uh, Dr. Ijaz Akram wrote his dissertation uh, under the supervision of Dr. Esposito and Dr. Nasser and Professor John Paul, if I'm correct. So, Dr. Ijaz, five minutes, please. Thank you, Vice um, Honorable Professor Esposito, uh, lovely colleagues and friends and students at the Atlanta. It's uh, nice to come back here. Back in 1989, uh, the Soviet Union went down, and in 1992, I came across this first book called The Islamic Threat. Ooh. Islamic Threat, so I thought this was going to be a nice spooky reading. And um, you know, I just started my graduate career at uh, the School of International Service at American University in Washington, D.C. And the book was by Professor Esposito, The Islamic Threat. So I read the book, I had serious doubts, I thought this man must be a closet Muslim. Never have I seen uh, a mainstream academic of the United States of America who puts up the best defense for Muslims. I was so empowered. When I came back to Washington, checked out and found out that Professor Esposito is in Georgetown. And I was only two miles away. So I registered with him and studied with him and had the honor of uh, being invited to his home a couple times and received a lot of coaching and guidance from him. And why was he so dear to me, my heart? Because I felt he spoke the truth at a time when there was this, uh, the earliest, you know, the Zionist assault had to build up to a point where it has built up today. Um, I found that he spoke the truth. And that itself was very transformative. But then I realized gradually, as the time went by, that, you know, media, the corporate media that we see is just a pack of lies. I mean, CNN and Fox News and my God, all of this stuff. And so I also realized that there's actually a market for truth. That we're so inundated by falsity that there's actually a market for truth. And so that's where a lot of 
works by Professor Esposito uh, has a hundred on made a very good lucrative uh, career as a celebrity academic of America uh, on the market truth, truth, for, truth market. So I want to invite actually most of you with a caution that in many universities, Lund is an excellent place. And I've had a, a hundred of the last 10, 11 years that I've served here. Um, you know, 99% of my time here was fabulous, excellent. But a few things can be changed also. One thing is the theory of knowledge. In humanities and social sciences, I feel that we are excessively antenative. There must be something good in our tradition. Can we search, look for it, and, and make it ours, and not become too uh, uncritically just throw everything away? Uh, so that would be throwing away babies with the bathwater. And here, the, the spiritual principles that come with, that are common between all of the religious traditions, and amongst us we have here, Professor Charles Wesley Amjadeli, Secretary of Martinez, who is a very, very eminent uh, professor and a scholar in America, is a theologist, Christian theologian as well. When I speak to people like him and people like Esposito, I really don't think that uh, they are, you know, I get a Muslim wife from them, even though they're Christians. You know, Professor Esposito gets this question asked all the time. Yeah, are you really a positive Muslim? And I'm sure that he has given many answers, but one that caught my attention was that I am a Roman Catholic who is 99% Muslim. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and I think that he's talking that, he's talking esoterically, that, you know, there is, uh, there is a common thing between religious traditions. And I think that uh, it is the universalism. And some of the paradigms of modernism may want us to believe differently. And so I would want to caution you as my uh, young you know, students, you know, my brothers and sisters and so forth, so that, you know, approach the theory of knowledge very carefully and that what you learned in your grandmother, your, your nanita, what she taught you all was not useless. You just need to find better discourses that explain the things that she told you. And so, and along with that, I mean, you know, modernity comes along, we like to have fun and party, of course, you know, have a lot of that too. And so, uh, so the, the approach towards religion itself is, has to be very, very transformative. And uh, I think that this message somewhere in the secular academia gets lost, unfortunately. So uh, my, my humble uh, call your attention towards this and, and, and the happy pursuit of your academic careers. Alhamdulillah, how about that work in this I think that uh, what Dr. Tijaz just did is uh, where uh, Professor Estuzio left off, uh, he picked up the, the discussion just took it a little bit, a little bit further uh, when Professor Smizuda is talking about uh, multiculturalism, multi-ethnic, uh, multi-ethnic, multi-religious, pluralistic society. Basically, what he's saying is that uh, if you want to translate it into, um, you know, uh, academic language, uh, the 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 dominant modern paradigm simply cannot hold, which can only work in zeros and ones, black and white. Uh, either you're with us or you're against us. That paradigm simply cannot hold. It cannot uh, imagine uh, a genuine pluralism. It cannot imagine uh, the claim that um, uh, a Muslim, or the, the, the statement that uh, Professor Suizu Lama committed Roman Catholic was 99% Muslim. Uh, we cannot under, this, this statement makes no sense from the perspective of Descartes, Kant, Hegel, Marx, it doesn't make any sense. And, and all of our uh, the dominant paradigm in the university is still based on that old way of thinking. And now we have to move, uh, it, it, it's not just a political thing, it's not just a cultural thing, uh, it also has to be an intellectual and academic thing to move towards um, a new paradigm. Uh, I can see, uh, soon to be Dr. Junaid Ahmed pointing towards his watch, meaning that we have run out of time. Uh, Professor Esposito has to get to um, another place. Uh, from us, a small little gift uh, before we go. So this is 
largely in recognition of all the work you've done to really defend Islam and Muslims in front of the world. Not defend in a political sense, but in an academic sense. So this is, you know, when we learned that you were coming, um, <clears throat> we know all kinds of scholars, people come here, but what made us so excited about your visit was what you've done for a better world, for a more tolerant world, for a, <clears throat> for a world that understands and accommodates and does not um, sort of fight or dismiss others violently. So your entire career has been for that. And this, the, these verses that we selected for you, a lot went into this. Uh, Asif the Sahib was kind to suggest me that then these, these are from Iqbal and um, <coughs> the statement that you just gave, right? the totally Catholic and 99% Muslim, the words we've chosen um, go, go entirely. It says... Once you put it, they are. Yeah, I say this? <laughs> okay. So it's in Farsi, it says, As harfe dil avezesh asrari hum peda. So in your delightful words, uh, the secret of the Kaaba is evident. Day kaaba ki didan de waliya bakhamas. Yesterday, although yesterday I saw within the sacred territory infidels roaming around intoxicated. And it's been it's done by our uh, resident calligrapher, and this is a tribute to you and all your work from the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences and the Lums Religious Society. Um, there's so many individuals involved with making everything happen today. It's just very difficult for me to name all of them, so I just won't name all of them. Just some of the few people: Rasid Sahib, Asif Tafar Sahib, Maham, Furkan, uh, you know, all the volunteers that we've had. Just all of you. Thank you so much. Although you get CP points for this and you were um, required to be here, I'm really grateful and I hope you got something greater than just pretending. Okay, so I'll hand it over to Dr. Basel. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. Our apologies that everything had to be rushed, but this is the, we did the best we could under the circumstances, so I hope you accept uh, us with our shortcomings. Thank you very much.